Welcome and thank you for joining us as we go through the sixth lesson of the Cornerstone Connections of the first quarter 2024. My name is Mikael Flex and on the panel we have John, Nelson, Biaki, Peter and our wonderful teens teachers. On the sign language we have Joyce and on the orchestra we have Subira and Shema. Now join me as I take you through the mission story which the title is Home for a boy, and the country is Nepal. We are starting off with an 11-year-old boy named Sudip, who was frightened when father suddenly fell ill and was rushed to the hospital in Nepal. What was wrong with father? What will happen next? The boy questioned himself. The doctors carefully checked father's liver. It wasn't working properly. The doctors carefully checked the father's kidneys. It wasn't working properly. The doctor carefully checked the father's lung. It wasn't working properly. The, the doctor checked the father's heart, and it wasn't working properly as well. This is very bad, the doctor said. Father's organs are failing because of his drinking. Father worked, father worked as a builder who built homes, but he also drank a lot of alcohol in his life. When he got off work, he drank. Sometimes when he woke up in the morning, he drank. Alcohol had poisoned his body, and he was in a very bad shape. Sudip wondered what will happen next. Mother also wondering what will happen next, because father was the only person who earned money for the family and in the family. The doctor said he was doing all he could to help the father. We're doing the best we can, he said. But the treatments didn't help father. For the liver stopped working, his kidneys stopped working, his lungs stopped working, and then his heart stopped working. It was a very dark, family, dark day for Sudip and the mother when father died. Sudip cried and cried mother as well. Several days passed and Sudip stopped crying, but mother kept on crying. She was worried about how she would feed Sudip. She was worried about who will pay for the school fees and the new clothes for the upcoming year. Sudip didn't know how he could help mother. He was only 11, so he cried with her. There was nothing else he could do. Mother and son cried and cried. Just when everything seemed hopeless, mother heard about an orphanage where poor children could live and study. The orphanage was, supposed, was operated by Seventh-day Adventists from South Korea. Mother had heard about Adventism many months earlier, and she wanted to go to an Adventist church on Sabbath, but father had forbidden her from going. He said to her, my father was not a Christian. My grandfather was not a Christian. We are not Christians. We worship our own God, and we will not go to a Christian church. But now father was gone. The Adventist orphanage seemed like the only answer. Mother sent Sudip to the orphanage, and two years have passed since Sudip arrived at the orphanage, and today he's a very happy boy. I'm very happy because I am growing up in a Christian orphanage, he said. I know who my savior is, and I want to know more and more about him. I want to become a pastor and serve the Lord the rest of my life. Every day, Sudip prays and thanks God for his blessing. Every Sabbath, Sudip goes to church and mother also goes to church every day, every Sabbath. But some of father's relatives are angry that Sudip and mother are going to church. They are trying to persuade them to stop going to church. Please pray for my relatives, Sudip said. I hope and believe that one day they will come to God. Thank you for your prayers. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help establish a school where children like Sudip can study in Nepal. Thank you for planning a very generous 13th Sabbath offering.
welcome and thank you for joining us to this week's Cornerstone Bible study. This week we'll study about an interesting lesson that talks about idol threats. Before we begin, I'd like the panelists to introduce themselves. I'll start from my extreme left. My name is Biaki Kibuage. My name is Peter Lewis. I'm John Mungai. I'm Nelson Yanumba. Thank you, panelists, moderating the lesson today. Um, my name is Teacher Donna, one of the team's teachers. Um, Biaki, please pray for us before we start. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us here today and allowing us to film these lessons for all the viewers, wherever they may be. Please let the Holy Spirit speak through us and let the viewers understand what we are trying to pass. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Amen. Uh, so we'll be talking about idol threats. This is the sixth lesson in our cornerstone. Uh, what are idol threats? And uh, before we answer that question, um, this lesson will help us reflect on the second commandment where God explicitly warns us against idol worship. It will also help us uh, to reflect on what we prioritize in our lives and if we have any idols in our lives, and what uh, we have put before God. So uh, an idol is anything that we place before God. And the Bible tells us that where our heart is, there is our treasure. So if our heart is in an, in an idol, then uh, that is where we place most of our priority. So as we go through this lesson, it will help us decipher if at all we have any idols. And to help us know about idol threats and idol worship, we will talk about uh, one of the kings of Israel. His name is Rehoboam. Uh, through the story, we'll be able to think about, uh, you know, what, what, what idol worship is, and we'll be able to think about ways that we can avoid idol worship. We'll also be able to uh, think about the influences that we have on other people whether it's our friends or our families. Rehoboam is a king who elevated himself uh, above, above God, and instead of asking for wisdom and assistance from God to rule the people, he instead elevated himself and made himself God as he ruled the people of Israel. So, Nelson, can you tell us a, a little bit about Rehoboam? Who is he? Uh, Rehoboam is the son of Solomon. Solomon was the son of David. David was the son of Jesse. Uh, David had taken over from Saul, who was the first king of Israel. Okay, rightly put. So Rehoboam was uh, the son of Solomon, and he was the fourth uh, king of Israel. He ruled Israel for around 17 years, and um, he had 18 wives, uh, 60 concubines, and he had uh, around 60 daughters and 28 sons. Rehoboam's mother, uh, was from an idolatrous nation. And we can see what kind of influence he had, or what kind of background he had, and this will influence the decision he made in his lives. So as you continue with the lesson, I'll ask John to read for us the key text. The key text today comes from the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 12, verse 11. I repeat 2 Chronicles, chapter 12, verse 1. And it says, After Rehoboam's position as king was established and he had become strong, he and all Israel with him abandoned the law of the Lord. Hmm. Thank you for reading the key text. So it's telling us Rehoboam, he established himself as the king of Israel. And after the Lord helped him and he became strong and his influence was strong all around Israel, now he negated the law of the Lord, him together with his people. So, John, kindly take us through the What Do You Think segment. In the What Do You Think seg segment, the question being asked is, rank the following items below in order of importance to the average teenager. One being the most important and ten being the least important. So personally, um, 
out of all of these options. What I think is most important in this list, I would say, is a Christ-like character. Maintaining a Christ-like character, not only behind closed doors, but not only when you're in front of people, but also behind closed doors, I think is very important. And a strong relationship with God is also very important. Um, I would say a loving family, good health, friends, and some of these can also be idols. So Nelson, which one of these would you say is an idol? I would say good looks can be an idol. Mm -hmm. uh, some people would treasure some of the things that God has given them instead of valuing the giver himself. Uh, 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 a lot of them, I'd say also musical abilities can also be an idol. You find a lot of people that use the gift that God has given them yeah. and produce ungodly things. So, um, Yaki, what else do you think can be an idol? I think a good reputation can be an idol to some. Because in the world we're living today, a lot of people care about how they look and how they present to others. And in trying to like make that make yourself look like a good person, you can put that ahead of God and focus too much too much on how people see you instead of on God. Those are all really good answers. And I personally also think friends, the friends that you keep can be an idol. Um, some people think of their friends very highly, and it also depends on what type of friends you're keeping. Are, the friends, are your friends drawing you closer to God or away from God? Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much, John, for allowing us to think about things around us and things that we have, either in, in, in form of um, people or things. Uh, we've realized that you know, having friends or a loving family or good looks or good grades is a good thing. But at the point where we put these things above God, where we elevate these things and we think about them as uh, the sole important things in our lives, then they become idols. So these are good things, but if we use them in the wrong way, or if we relate to people in the wrong way, then they become our idols, okay? So um, we'll talk a bit about Rehoboam, even as we go into the story. We want to um, learn about his encounter and how um, he allowed idol worship uh, in the kingdom of Israel. So Peter, tell us about uh, the story. Okay, the story is based on 1 Kings chapter 12, to 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 1 to 14, and 2 Chronicles chapter, chapter 10, to 12. Okay, Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone there to make him a king. When Jeroboam, son of Nabat, heard this, he, had, he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Sol Solomon. He returned from Egypt, so, that, so they sent for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, your father put heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam, and as the king had said, come back to me in three days, the king answered the people harshly, reject, rejecting the advice given him by the elders. He followed the advice the advice of the young men and said, my father made you, made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So all the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the town of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled them. King Rehoboam said out of out Adomarian, who was in charge of all forced labor, but the Israelites stoned him to death. King Rehoboam, however, managed to get into his chariot and escape to Jerusalem. So Israel had been in rebellion against the house of David. When Rehoboam arrived in, 
after Obama arrived in Jerusalem, he mustered Ju Judah and Benjamin, 180,000 sand able young men, to go to war against Israel and to re reign the kingdom for Rehoboam. But this, but this word of the Lord came to Sh Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel in Judah and Benjamin, this is what the Lord says, do not go up to fight against your fellow Israelites. Go home, every, every one of you, for this is my doing. So, so they obeyed the word of, of the Lord and returned back from marching against Jeroboam. Because Rehoboam humbled himself, the Lord angered turned from him, and he was not totally de destroyed. King Rehoboam established himself firmly in Jer Jerusalem and continued as king. He was 40, 41 year, years old when he became king, and he reigned seven, 17 years in Jerusalem. The city the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, in which to put his name, his name, his, his mother, mother's name was Nah, Nama. She was an Ammonite. He did evil because he had not set his heart on seeking the Lord. Yeah, maybe if what goes out of, into out of the story, mm -hmm. uh, John, what 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 are some of the people that you know there? Could you tell us about them? Um, I, I know who Adoram is, and from the story we can see that Adoram, or Adoniram, mm -hmm. was a messenger of Rehoboam, who was sent to impose forced labor on the people of Israel to get them to work for, to go back to work for Rehoboam. Mm -hmm. And Shemaiah who's also mentioned in the story, is the prophet who went and told Rehoboam mm -hmm. that he shouldn't actually go and fight against his own people. Mm -hmm. We see Hadad. Hadad was one of the people who waged war against, he attacked Solomon during his, re his reign. Mm -hmm. um, and Jeroboam, of course, is who replaced Rehoboam when was leading the ten tribes. Mm -hmm. You can see Ahijah. Ahijah was a prophet who he was the prophet who was sent to tell Jeroboam that he was gonna become king of the ten tribes. Mm -hmm. Um Shishak was one of Rehoboam's adversaries. Mm -hmm. He attacked Rehoboam during his reign. And Marker was one of David's six wives. Mm. Yeah, thank you, John. Now, now that we've gone through the, the story, maybe, I don't know, Peter, maybe you could give us a lesson that you've learned from the story. Okay, the lesson I've learned from the story is that God is merciful and he's willing to forgive those who are humble. Yes. Yeah, thank you, thank you. One other lesson I learned was that, you know, without God, you, you can't really do anything. We see Rehoboam, when, once he turned away from the Lord, everything just came crashing down yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay thank you for that um, so maybe Biaki can tell us uh, what do you think led to uh, Rehoboam's collapse we see he was strongly established uh, mm -hmm. after Solomon and then um, after some time the kingdom came crumbling down mm -hmm. such that he was a king that divided the United Israel kingdom which has 12 tribes he was a king that divided um, the kingdom into two. So he ruled Judah, and uh, the other king, Jeroboam, ruled Israel, which are 10 tribes. So what do you think led to Rehoboam's collapse? Now, when Rehoboam accepted what he was told by the prophet to go back and not to wage war, mm -hmm. we see that he, at first he was prospering. He was bringing both, um, to both the tribes. Yes. Um, into like prosperity, mm -hmm. yeah? So what happened is he started to put his faith and his security mm -hmm. into his riches. Mm -hmm. 
mm. into what he had, mm -hmm. the material things. Yeah. And little by little, he stopped putting his faith in God. Mm -hmm. He signed treaties with other nations. Yes. And that, in turn, led to his fall. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe, John, you can tell us what else do you think led to the collapse of this kingdom? I think Rehoboam became prideful. Mm -hmm. And you can see that the people went to him and asked him mm. to, he told him that his father Solomon yep. had put very heavy burdens on them. And instead he said, my father made your yoke heavy, I'll make it even heavier. Mm -hmm. So I think he became prideful yep. and 10 tribes were stripped from his reign. Yes. It was, you know, even from this story we can the question that Nelson asked, mm -hmm. but also learn that there are consequences to your actions. Yes. And that God took those 10 tribes from him because he was being prideful. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you for sharing. And, uh, you know, his pride reminds me of someone in the Bible who was also very prideful. And this was Lucifer. When we read Isaiah um, chapter 14, maybe we can all get there. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. This is Lucifer proclaiming, and this is said in his heart. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. This is Lucifer asserting that he wants to be above the most high. He wants to take the place of God, okay? So in, at any time or in any circumstance where we want to take the place of God, then we become idols, okay? Or if you allow any person to take the place of God in our lives, then they become our idols. As um, John rightly said, Rehoboam became very prideful, and instead of listening to his people and listening to the counsel of the wise men who came to advise him, how he should rule the kingdom of Israel, um, he went and listened to his young friends. This also tells us the importance of you know, peer influence, yeah? And the influence other people can have around you. So his young, uh, his friends told him that he should assert his authority and he should re rule the people with more severity than his father, King Solomon. So apart from his pride and apart from um, the idolatry that he allowed in the nation, even uh, the influence of his peers also led to the collapse of the nation, okay? So this, this begs the question that um, how can we in our lives negatively influence uh, you know, people around us? And if at all we drift away, if we were to drift away from our Christianity as young people um, in the church, then how do we affect the people around us? Is there any influence that we have, uh, Nelson? Is there any influence that you have at home or in school? Yeah, yeah I would say, uh, mm -hmm. let's say we drift away from the narrow path uh, and we end up doing something bad. When, let's say, for example, our parents see us, mm -hmm. maybe it's not hurting them physically, but mentally, in the heart, they care for us. So when, when this happens, they, they feel bad. Yes. Yeah. So rightfully said, as much as our parents are older than us, we can negatively influence even their religion when you drift away from the faith. Peter, what, what do you think, or who can we negatively influence if we drift away from our Christianity? Okay, if we drift away from our Christianity, it's, we will negatively influence our friends, those who we live, we live with them day to day, those who we interact with them. Because the, if your friend if you have a friend who is a Christian and you're not, eventually you might stop or he might also join you, he might also join you in the um, paganism which you are, yes. So basically you're saying we can have that influence, you know, to our friends. Yes. Yaki, what, what, who can we negatively influence? Um, I think, let's say if you're in a position of power, you have mm -hmm. authority, and you turn away from God, you start doing your own things, the people who follow you, who look up to you, might start doing the same. Okay. Yeah. All right. And John, maybe you can tell us who can you negatively influence? Um, I believe if you have younger brothers, mm -hmm. um, cousins, relatives, people who look up to you for yeah. guidance, mm -hmm. 
um, you maintaining a Christ-like character is very important because they're going to look up to you, mm. what you're doing. Yep. Look to follow in your footsteps. Mm -hmm. So you have to set the right mm -hmm. example yeah. for the young ones. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. And from all your experiences and your sharing, I've gathered that our influence, um, or rather we don't live for ourselves only. Whatever we do, whatever we say, however we dress, um, will influence people around us either positively or negatively. And warn to us if we were to influence um, someone else uh, negatively. So we need to remember that whenever we walk on the face of the earth, either we will help someone to walk uh, you know, on the path to heaven, or we will be the influence that will lead them to the path uh, to hell. Um, I have an interesting question that I came across when you know, reading the lesson. Maybe we can think about it. We don't have to answer it at this point. And it was asking, what aspects of God's law do we struggle to keep as young people? What, what aspects of the law? Because at this point, if you realize what aspects of the law you're struggling to keep, then you you tread very careful because you know if you fall in these aspects of the law, then you'll be a negative influence. So let's think about that. Um, Puyaki, you want to tell us something about the flashlight? Yeah. So the flashlight comes from the book of Prophet, Prophets and Kings, page 91. Um, the 12 tribes of Israel were divided. The tribes of Judah and Benjamin composing the lower or southern kingdom of Judah and the rulership of Rehoboam, while the 10 northern tribes formed and maintained a separate government known as the kingdom of Israel, with Jeroboam as their ruler. Thus was fulfilled the prediction of the prophet concerning the, rend the rending of the kingdom. The cause was from the Lord. Um, the second one is, but as time passed, the king put his trust in the power of position and in the strongholds that he fortified. Little by little, he gave way to inherited weakness until he threw his influence wholly on the side of idolatry. That's page 93. So this is just a summary of the story where we see um, first Rehoboam, he, want, he wanted to become king because as the son of the king, the former king, you expect yourself to be next in line. Mm -hmm. But the prophet Abijah went and told Jeroboam that he used to take up some of um, the tribes of Israel, 10 of them. Mm -hmm. So Rehoboam, what he did to separate Israel was when they asked for um, him to lighten their yoke, mm -hmm. he instead hardened it and made it worse. And that caused the separate governments to form. And Rehoboam went and he prospered the two southern kingdoms of Judah and Benjamin. But in time, he put his power in his position and in his strongholds that he had fortified. And that led him away from God and into idolatry. Hmm. All right. Um, thank you for that. Would you also read for us uh, the book of Second Timothy, chapter 3, verse 2 to 5? OK. Second Timothy chapter two verse chapter three verse two to five chapter three verse two to five and it says, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Thank you for that. And this basically uh, describes what kind of people will be living uh, towards the end of time. And this is the time we're living in right now, uh, basically describing people who have kept uh, certain things uh, before God, and they have idols in place of uh, God, who is Jehovah. But I'd want us to reflect on this question. Uh, we've realized that some of the things that we have in our lives are treasures, yeah? 
But if we use them in a wrong way, then they become idols. So what is the difference then between having a treasure and making something an idol? What would be the difference? Yes, Yaki, do you have a response? Yeah. yeah, a treasure is something you prioritize, something that you treat a certain way. You take time with it or someone. Mm -hmm. And making something an idol or someone would be putting it above God, spending more time with it, you know, prioritizing it above God. That's when something becomes an idol and anything can become an idol. Okay. Uh, maybe you have a response? Mm -hmm. um, I think a treasure can be, let's take for example, someone that you appreciate, mm. someone that you enjoy being around. Yes. And does, it doesn't have to necessarily be an idol because mm -hmm. you can treasure someone who, someone who brings you closer to God. And from a de definition of an idol, it's something that comes in the way of relationship with God. Yes. So treasuring someone that actually brings you closer to God can help you in relationship with God. Mm -hmm. So that means if I have a friend and I spend more time with my friend, uh, maybe calling them or texting them, or she's the first person, or he's the first person that I'm thinking about before I, you know, before I read my Bible. Um, does that mean that that friend is an idol? Yeah, um, for sure, friends can become idols. Yeah. But I think, let's say if you're sending each other verses, having devotion, um, I think that would be better because mm -hmm. you get you're both growing each other. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Nelson, you want to tell us what you think is the difference between a treasure and an idol? Yeah, I'd say mm -hmm. maybe. Something can be a treasure, but then at some point it becomes an idol when you you don't use the treasure to glorify God. Yeah. Yeah. So that's if you use your gift mm -hmm. in a bad way, mm -hmm. uh, that's when it becomes an idol because you forget the reason God gave you those gifts. All right, all right. Thank you for that. Peter, do you have anything to add? <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, so we'll move on to the Friday uh, section. And uh, we'll read from the book of James 1.19. James 1.19. So James uh, tells us, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. This basically just uh, summarizes uh, what Rehoboam failed to do. He was not uh, slow to hear, meaning he listened to advice from the wrong people. And then um, he was not slow to speak because he spoke very harsh words uh, to the people of Israel. And um, he was also not slow to wrath because he became angry and his anger had so many consequences, including dividing the United Kingdom of Israel. And all this was contributed because of idolatry. Um, so it begs the question, what kind of influence do we have on the people around us? Yeah. And even as we come to the close of our lesson, I just want to go, you know, and ask the panelists to maybe give us their closing remarks as we finish. I'll start with Biaki. You can tell us what stood out for you in this lesson. What are you taking home today? I'm taking home that uh, when you put something above God, you might not even notice it at first. It just happens little by little, and in turn, you can find yourself just fully into that thing. And so what I get from that is that you have to be conscious about what you spend time doing and who you are with so that you can fully grow your relationship with God and lead him and be led by him. Yeah. Thank you, Biaki. Um, Peter, you can tell us your closing remarks. Okay. What also do for me is the part where God lowered his anger. Well, God turned his anger away from Jeroboam. Yeah. So I, God is merciful. And if we humble ourselves and turn away from all our sins and be diligently seek him, he will, he will, he will have mercy on, on us. Yes. Okay. 
Mm, thank you. John, what are you taking away home? Um, I believe this story teaches us that mm-hmm. God can put you in positions of power, mm-hmm. in positions that you have very a lot of influence on other people. Mm-hmm. Um, but even when we're put in these positions, we shouldn't get prideful like Rehoboam did. Mm-hmm. And we should remember the reason that was there in the first place. Amen. Yes, Nelson, what are you taking away home? Yeah, uh, I think the story just, it, it's captured in uh, what Jesus says in Matthew, where he says, uh, no one can serve two masters. Mm-hmm. One, will, one will eventually take importance over the other. Mm. But uh, something also that comes towards the end of the story is that uh, Rehoboam, he, he, he becomes humble again. He's able to turn away. And God, therefore, uh, has mercy on him. Mm. And it also gives us an encouragement that sometimes even though we fall, we just we can rise again and follow in the ways of the Lord. Thank you, Nelson, and thank you, everyone, for sharing your takeaway. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll just summarize and say that this lesson will help us uh, reflect on what we have prioritized in our lives and what we have allowed to be above God in our lives. And then again, um, it also helps us to reflect on communication. How do we communicate to the people around us? Do we listen to our peers or do we seek counsel from God and uh, from our parents who are God-fearing? Yeah. And then um, it was also taught us about healthy boundaries uh, with people and things that we need to establish Uh, good and healthy boundaries so that we cannot uh, be a negative influence or we cannot be negatively influenced. So I'd uh, like to thank all the panelists for joining us as we discussed the lesson this week. And um, I pray that you'll be able to think about the story of Rehoboam um, and you'll be able to make a positive uh, decision or positive, it has made a positive impact in your life such that you'll be able to make God the priority in your life. So with those remarks, I'll ask um, John to pray for us as we finish. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, Father, thank you this day for gracing us with your presence during this lesson, helping us learn that you are merciful, that you are almighty, loving Father, and that you are able put us in positions of power. Help us to always remember to put you first in everything that we do. Remember you in our daily lives. Help us to be positive influences to everyone around us and to always maintain a Christ-like character loving father. And as this year begins, help us to, grow, to maintain and to grow our relationship with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.